set up a sting operation in Queens, and that was where Ahmad Salem really did the great work for the feds. But in any case, so first Andy McCarthy meets this spy. Uh, he doesn't know he's a spy. He says to Ali, what are you doing in Africa? And Ali is working on the African embassy bombing plot, but he says, I'm running a scuba diving business. And this federal prosecutor used to be a U.S. Marshal, apparently takes his word. Nothing happens. Years later, in 1997 now, they're perfecting the plot to blow up these two embassies that, that Ali began in 93, took the pictures in 93. Now we're in 97, four years, uh, three, you know. Now, listen to this. Dan Coleman, one of the elite agents from this unit mm -hmm. under Fitzgerald, goes to Africa, searches the house of a guy named Wadi El Haj, who is one of the co-conspirators. Sure. And Wadi El Haj, in his house, has all this Ali Muhammad-related stuff. And they go, oh, my gosh. Our guy, Ali Muhammad, is involved with these guys? So Patrick Fitzgerald himself flies to Sacramento, where Ali is living, meets him in a restaurant by the state house, tries to get him to turn. And Ali says to him, I love bin Laden. I don't need a fatwa or religious decree to attack America. I have a bunch of sleepers I can make operational at any time. And he goes basically like this and leaves. Oh, Patrick Fitzgerald turns to this agent, Jack Clunan, who I interviewed and said, that is the most dangerous man I've ever met. We cannot leave him on the street. What happens? Leaves him on the street for 10 more months. The bombs go off in Africa. They take a month to arrest him. At the embassy in Kenya. In Kenya and Tanzania. Tanzania 220 right. some dead, 4,000 injured. A plot that Ali began in 93 under the noses of the FBI. And not just the, I'm not talking about the Wichita office. This is the New York, New York office, office, okay? Right. And so basically they, what they do is they cut a deal with him to avoid the death penalty. Now what happens when you cut a deal? Like Sammy the Bull Gravano kills 19 people, he gets five years. Why? Because he becomes a star witness for the mm -hmm. government. That's what a deal. Right. It's a promise for a promise. Exactly. Ali Muhammad never goes on the stand when Patrick Fitzgerald tries bin Laden for the, day, uh, for the embassy trial in February of 01. I believe. Why? Because they, the feds are so embarrassed by how they screwed up with this guy. They don't want the defense to peel back the layers. But what if that had happened in February? Remember what's happening now in March, April? My hair's on fire. George Tennant, the lights blinking red. Richard Clark, Condi Rice, the Phoenix Memo, July 10th. All this confluence of intelligence is starting to percolate. And if they had peeled back the layers on Al-Qaeda's true intentions through Ali Muhammad, in, the, in February, who knows what might have happened that summer. Mm -hmm. So that's why I've taken the time to document this remarkable story. It's an epic. Well, tell me, uh, that's one reason why, <coughs> but tell me, I mean, since it's all over and done with, what possible value could come <coughs> with showing that the government made a series of foolish to criminal errors that allowed this disaster to happen. I mean, they've seemed to have changed their whole tack on it since then. Well, actually, in my opinion, with respect to the FBI, they have not sufficiently reformed. And that's why I keep telling this story, the because, story so you know, as Justice, um, uh, Justice Louis Brandeis said, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Now, the nine, I, my second book, as you know, you had me on, it's called Cover Up, was a fo focused on the 9-11 Commission. Mm -hmm. Now, if 9-11 Commission thought it was important enough to investigate. This is the greatest mass murder in American history, and it's become a cold case. No one's been indicted. The mm -hmm. Osama bin Laden's never been indicted. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the one they call the mastermind, the uncle of Ramzi mm -hmm. Youssef, who I say is the true mastermind, he was waterboarded 183 times. He'll never be brought to justice in any conventional sense. So what we need, and, and then when I examined the 9-11 Commission, I found out that half of the staff were from the very agencies that were supposed to be auditing, which is why no one was held accountable. Well, could they maybe have gotten information from the waterboarding and all these other things they did that was more valuable than, any, than, than actually, you know, putting somebody on trial and having all their methods investigated by the people. Well, the ar that's the Cheney argument that somehow we prevented all this terror. But waterboarding is inherently, and this is not Peter Lance talking, P people in the CIA have admitted this, it's inherently uh, an inefficient interrogation technique because people who are really hard and go deeper and the ones who are have, per have peripheral information give up their mother to make it stop. Now, the true test of that what happened in the Philippines with Abdul Hakim Murad, the partner of Ramzi Youssef. He was going to be the original ATA, the lead pilot. He'd been trained in four U.S. flight schools. They had a fire in their bomb factory in January 95. So they capture him. For three days, they waterboarded him, basically, and he gave them nothing. Then Colonel Rodolfo Mendoza took over, and using trickery, guile, sleep, and food deprivation, and a threat to turn him over to the Mossad, <laughs> which really scared him, he then gave peeled back this entire 
plot that oh, was realized on 9 11. Yeah. yeah. Now, that information. I prove in my books went to the Southern District in 95, but because they were so preoccupied with trying Ramzi Youssef for the Bojinka case, they, for whatever reason, ignored it. But one of the unanswered questions... That was, was another case to blow up planes Planes, but not fly them into buildings. That was, get on the first leg of a two-leg hop of a plane leaving Asia. United flight from Hong Kong to Malaysia, plant a little bomb on above the fuel tank, mm -hmm. get off, because you're not. it's not a suicide Mission. Right. Then the plane flies to San Francisco, boom, over the Pacific. Right. Yousef did a test on a Philippine Airlines flight, but he was three feet short of the fuel tank. Well, we only have four minutes to go because we, I love to talk about Flight 800, which is the unsolved uh, right. bomb that, or uh, unsolved well, I believe, disaster yeah. that brought a plane down off the coast of Long Island. Right. I believe that that was an Al-Qaeda act of terror, that it was a bomb. And if you go to PeterLance.com, there is a section on my theory about TWA 800. This is a, I've, I've had seasoned FBI agents who worked that case, who have read my books, have come to me and said they absolutely believe I was dead on. I make a, it's a circumstantial case, but it's compelling. Okay, we have three minutes. I want anyway. to focus on the last couple of minutes on Patrick Fitzgerald. <coughs> right. What happened with Patrick Fitzgerald? He threatened to sue you, nothing ever happened to them? What happened was the, the, the book came out in hardcover in uh, uh, the fall of 06, but was lost because it came out the week of the OJ scandal mm -hmm. with Harper Collins. The book was virtually lost. So a year later, when uh, the book was about to come out in paperback, Patrick Fitzgerald sent the first of four letters threatening to sue for libel as a private citizen. Now understand, the system in America... Did he mention this show? <laughs> <laughs> no, but he might now. I mean, who knows? Okay. Anyway. No, so anyway, Patrick Fitzgerald says the first... He's rejected by Mark Jackson, the lawyer for Harper Collins, calls the book an important work of investigative journalism. Undeter undaunted. Patrick sends a 16-page letter, this time faxes from Office of U.S. Attorney, as if to send a message. Now, because of who he was, if it was Paul DiRenzio or, or John Doe or anybody, or Peter Lance, a citizen, the book would have been out. But because of who he was, I'm, I'm speaking practically, mm -hmm. Harper said to me, why don't we go back and look at the book? Let's take a look. I said, fine. And we revetted this entire book. It took 14 months, took me out of play. I've got another book, 666, that's over a year and a half delayed. And he sent a third letter in September of 08, and he used the word demand twice in the same sentence. And then when he found out the book was coming out last June, he sent a letter on June 2nd, said, if this book comes out and it libels me, I will sue. So Newsweek broke the story. Boris Kochik of New York Magazine mm -hmm. broke the story. And the AP had a big thing. And we haven't heard a word from Pat, because he knows that in order to sue for libel, he has to show malice or reckless disregard for the truth. This book had 1,420 notes, 30 pages of documentary appendices, Forbes.com called it meticulously research. I did my homework. I stand behind this book, and so has my publisher. And I welcome Patrick Fitzgerald at any forum on this program. Meet me in a. In a He's invited. We'll fit him in. I will fit him. We'll I have about five questions, Mr. Fitzgerald, to ask you. And one of them is, and, I'll, and then we'll end. Why did they keep the hunt for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed a secret? They got his nephew Ramsey through a very public hue and cry. They put his picture on matchbook covers. Two million dollar reward. A young South African found it, dropped a dime on him, and they grabbed him like they did in the old West the old-fashioned way, with a want poster. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, they knew that what he was that he wasn't doing some kind of a plot and they didn't even mention him the feds until 19 january of 98 by then the plot was well underway in munich uh, or in hamburg so the point is why that's one of the great unanswered questions the 9 11 commission didn't even touch that okay we have anyway. less than a minute so what's going to happen next you're working on a new book 666 yeah i'm working on a book that has to do with the aspect of the story from 1996 where these two terrorists yusuf and murad had a, a mob figure in the jail cell in between them, and there's a treasure trove of evidence that was passed back and forth that was later suppressed by the feds. I contend because uh, it was going to derail some mob cases in Brooklyn. I did a piece for Playboy, and you'll be shocked to know there are articles in Playboy. I, I, um, <laughs> something you didn't know. There are and, articles. Uh, I did we, a piece we did one in Penthouse once. All right, well, there's one on my website. Case, yeah. You go to PeterLance.com, you see the bunny, and click on it called The Chilling Effect, where I detail that story. But I'm going to focus on that in my new book called 666. Great. Thank you, Peter Lance. We look forward to it. And thank you again for coming on our show. And it's we'll always see great you again. To be Good here. luck.